Okay, let me see this. Back. Okay. All right, so that the uh, trauma is a big topic, obviously. So a lot of questions on the test. Uh, I have a hundred slides, so I'm just going to rock and roll, and uh, and then obviously, hopefully, I can send this. It's a, it's a very large thing. And I'm the last talk, so I can go a little bit overboard if you want me to. Okay. Um, yeah, the last one today, sir. So uh, you know, however long you need. So uh, trauma systems, you just should know it. It's a trauma system that's composed of the trauma centers and the EMS system. A whole one trauma center basically can do everything, has all sorts of specialties. It's also a leader in trauma prevention, education, and research. A level twos should have almost all the clinical powers of a level one, perhaps some things like uh, implantation and things like that, maybe not. They also need to participate in prevention, education, and research. And uh, and then level three centers are there to resuscitate, operate on trauma emergencies, basic things, and perhaps they need to do has uh, transfer agreements with uh, other subspecialties, advanced ortho, neurosurgery, things like that. In pre-hospital care, some of the latest trauma triage protocols. They they have protocols to show where they should go, what kind of trauma center, the closest center. Uh, we practice scoop and run. They get the patient as fast as you can to the trauma center and do uh, interventions in the ambulance. If an airway can't be, um, okay. If a uh, airway can't can't be maintained, uh, if an airway uh, can be maintained by bag mass, that's the way to go. Don't try and intubate uh, unless you have a, a, a special uh, someone with advanced techniques. Uh, decompress the chest with no breath sounds and hypotension. They might have a, a, a tension in the thorax, and uh, it gives you a license to do it, but they have to be in shock also. You don't hyperventilate brain injuries anymore. Um, don't give uh, too much fluid. Uh, uh, the uh, INO catheters are used in patients in arrest in the severe shock because you can get them in faster than um, than, than I mean. Um, the use of tourniquets is back, uh, obviously, to stop the bleed, direct pressure. Uh, we allow ANSETH now in the ambulance for open fractures in the first hour. Some ambulance companies are using TXA for hemorrhaging patients in shock. And uh, and you can clear C-spines in the field with the nexus criteria. Which I'll go over some of that. We have targets everywhere except the neck. Okay. You should know the Glasgow Coma Scale, of course. Uh, patients who have uh, are considered comatose if they are eight or less. The classic coma scale is used in a revised trauma score. Patients, the highest number you can get is 12. Really, any number, about 10 or less, uh, patients are considered for a higher uh, trauma alert or code um, and should be going to a major trauma center. Uh, these are the kind of triage trauma uh, guidelines that you probably have in your own hospitals. You should be aware of them. Uh, basically, the, uh, the, the highest tier of trauma response is to patients in physiologic abnormalities and penetrating injuries to the torso and various other things that you can see there, just so you're kind of aware. Of course, initial assessment and management, primary survey, A, B, C, D, and E, airway breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. The secondary survey is a complete physical exam. Your adjuncts are x-rays, usually just a chest x-ray now in the trauma bay, your FAST exam, and uh, possible CT scan plus minus if they need it, or if, you, or if they're not uh, hemodynamically unstable. Emergency intubations like chest tubes, airway, things like that, done. Uh, resuscitation is done to a, a degree with the crystalloid, usually just one liter now. And if the patient needs more, uh, then, uh, and, and, and if you think they're seriously hemorrhaging, you should initiate a massive transfusion protocol. Tertiary survey uh, is done within the first 24 hours to capture missed injuries, which can be a rate of 8 to 12%. At the same time, you do an alcohol brief intervention. Uh, which is put forth by the American College of Surgeons because it can help decrease recidivism of injury with uh, alcohol-related. <clears throat> airway, patients talking, the airway is fine. If they had strider, it could be intrinsic, blood uh, vomit that's blocking the airway, teeth. It could be extrinsic, like a hematoma of the neck that's pushing on the airway, or it could have direct damage to the airway itself. Uh, if you can be, if you can do a bag mouth bask, uh, uh, mask, that's fine. You should wait to uh, make sure the patient's well uh, uh, oxygenated and has the necessary expertise in the trauma bay 
if you need any kind of advanced airway or intubation. A definitive airway is a cuff tube in the trachea. RSA, I is using a sedative, succinylcholine, and cricoid pressure. Right? Everything's done with rapid uh, sequence because most patients obviously are not MPO. Um, an LMA is the most common airway used as a rescue airway if you can't intubate the patient. Cricothyroidomy, which a picture of is done uh, just below the thyroid cartilage, above the cricoid cartilage, and that little triangle you can feel in your neck just below your arm's apple. The GSO is score of less than eight, equal or less than eight, intubate. Uh, if the patient has an inhalation injury with burns around the face, certainly any carbonaceous sputum, they should be intubated um, because they'll lose their airway in transit. And patients who are in bad shock should also be intubated. There's a cri picture of cric, membrane there, tube in there. You can, if you can't get a, you try a six tracheostomy. If you can't get that in there, use a six and the tracheal tube. So uh, chest trauma. If you have no breath sounds and you're in shock, they get a chest tube or at least decompression. You can the old way to do it was decompress at the second intercostal space mid uh, clavicular line with a big needle. Some people just advocate going right ahead and, and doing a uh, chest tube, or at least a decompression with your finger, especially if patients are in arrest. If a patient has penetrating trauma, think chest tube, especially if they're in shock. Um, if they have penetrating trauma in the box or even out of the box, they're shown that they can still have cardiac injuries. Make sure you do a fast for a cardiac tamponade. Massive hemothorax is defined as 1,500 cc's or greater than 300 cc's an hour over three hours. Thoracic emergencies are tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, bronchial tear, and massive pneumothorax, and an open pneumothorax, which is really a tension pneumothorax. And you can see some of the other uh, things, which I'll get more into in my thoracic trauma part. Um, uh, you check for pulses. Usually you can feel a radial pulse at 80, femoral 60, carotid 40. Um, you see levels of shock there. Patients have Normal vital signs in level one up to 15%, 15 to 30%. Tachycardia is the key. They also be aware of a decreased pulse pressure, and patients usually say they're thirsty, so those are all good signs. Over 30%, if you're, you're going to be an obviously shock with hypotension, kidney will be a and of course 40% uh, the severe shock, and they're on death's door. Level three and four most likely well, four will definitely need a massive transfusion protocol. And unless that level three responds quickly, resuscitation they might need also. Response to resuscitation is response to non-response number of intermittent response where they blood pressure and pulse get better, but then they get worse again, a sign of ongoing bleeding. Other forms of shock and trauma are neurogenic from a cerebral spine injury, and of course, obstructive from a tension pneumothorax, tamponade, or post-resuscitation shock. Um, always, always give the patient fluid and blood until you're sure about one other cause of shock. The exception, of course, being attention pneumothorax. Access is too large for IE, by these. Think of an IO early, and then uh, once you have access with the interosseous catheter, you can go for a central line. Usually you put a central line in uh, up in the chest if the patient has an abdominal trauma. If they have a chest trauma, you put the central line in the femoral vein. Um, you can give one liter crystalloid now, and then uh, you should reach for massive transfusion if uh, you is a sign that the patient's been hemorrhagic shock. We also have an adjunct of using Reboa, which is a balloon uh, catheter that you can put up into the aorta at various uh, uh, stages. One is in the chest, three is down in the abdomen for pelvis fracture, one is for any abdominal type bleeding. We also have, I uh, can use AD thoracomy, we'll get more into that, and other uh, damage control and compartment center, which I'll explain later. Five areas that you need to look for a significant hemorrhage and blunt trauma patient. Uh, because penetrating trauma should be a little bit more straightforward. Uh, the thorax, the chest x-ray will rule out, rule out a, a large uh, hemothorax. The fast should be able to help you with the uh, blood in the abdomen. If the uh, DPL is outclassed now, you only use DPL now. Uh, if the uh, fast is equivocal and the patient's still uh, hypotensive, you can't find the source. Um, you shouldn't take uh, hemodynamically unstable patients with CT scan. Uh, we probably push the envelope on that a lot because people like to know where it is. The scans are nearby, possibly. But the rule on the exam is hemodynamic and unstable patients should not go to the CAT scan. Figure it out without a CAT scan. You, pelvis uh, 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 will be the source if they have a pelvis fracture. Retroperitoneum, really the only way you're going to find that is if you're in the operating room or if you get a CT scan. 
Long bone fractures can cause significant blood loss, but they probably should be uh, responders. And of course, external bleeding you should be able to see. Massive transfusion is defined as 10 more units of blood for 24 hours. Uh, patients present with metabolic acidosis and hypothermia, high risk of coagulopathy. Trauma centers have to have a protocol. The ratio is one to one to one. That's one unit of RBCs, one unit of FFP, and 10,000 platelets. So most platelets contain about 50 to 60,000 of platelets. So one pack of platelets is equal to five RBCs, five FFP. You need to give TXA to a hemorrhaging patient if you get them within three hours, one gram, and you give the second gram over by uh, eight hours for the CRASH-2 study. Uh, patients can get uh, prothrombin complex uh, if they're on warfarin, and actually there's some efficacy with the novel oral uh, anticoagulants also. ACS guidelines uh, um, you know, for AD, AD thoracotomies, it's rarely indicated for patients receiving PR, CPR and blunt trauma. Uh, it's limited to those patients who lose their vital signs in the ED and you have a kind of sense of where the bleeding is. You can get them to the operating room. If they have penetrating trauma, it's indicated uh, if they have signs of life within 15 minutes of them coming to the ED. Uh, always think about it with penetration to the box, but there's penetration from the back, penetration from the side that it also can hit the heart. Usually the patients you can save have cardiac injuries where you can, and they're dying of a pericardial tamponade which you can relieve. Now they're dying of bleeding, but there's sources that we'll talk about how to deal with that. Um, uh, if they have other injuries in the abdomen or the chest, the survival rate is much lower. Indication for kids is the same. Um, for disability is a, a GCS exam and checking movement of arms and legs. We're looking for spinal cord injury also. And for exposure, especially important penetrating trauma, you need to know where the holes are. You check under the seat collar, you check in all the cracks and crevices. Make sure you cover the patient up to avoid hypothermia after you've done the exposure. For brain trauma, hyperventilation is bad because it decreases the blood flow to the brain, except if you have an acute dilated pupil and you're on the way from the trauma bay to the CT, then you can keep them from herniating uh, temporarily. If you have a dilated pupil in the trauma bay, use hyperventilation and mannitol unless the patient's hypotensive. Please avoid hypotension with brain trauma and increases their uh, morbidity and mortality by 400%. Hypoxia is second. Uh, you don't use steroids for brain trauma. Decompress the brain on the side of the dilated pupil. You can see in the picture the dilated pupil on that side is the same side of the brain. That's where it's going to be 97% of the time. You avoid hyponatremia in brain trauma. You avoid hyperglycemia in brain trauma. When you do need to correct for hyponatremia, don't do too fast. Not more than 10 mil equivalents per day. You can get central myelin nitrate. Cerebral salt wasting, SIDH, and DI are all part of brain trauma. SIDH, which is uh, inappropriate uh, uh, secretion of the uh, antidiuretic hormone, is with is with hypervolemia, and so uh, so the patients are usually not dry. Cerebral salt wasting is from a natriuretic peptide that causes hypovolemia also. So that's the way you make the difference between the two. And DI is the 300 rule. You should have 300 uh, uh, higher serum osmolality and 300, less than 300 urine osmolality. If a patient develops DI and they have a bad brain injury, it's usually a bad prognosis. It means that they've killed off their hypothalamus. You can get a DI, though, if you have direct injury to your hypothalamus or your pituitary gland, so that's not necessarily a bad prognosis if the patient otherwise is doing fairly well. Um, an epidural uh, hematoma, you can see there, is associated with a fracture, especially in younger folks. Usually you usually get the classic lucid period after a brief loss of consciousness. It's, used, it's the middle meningeal artery that's bleeding. Um, in older folks, it tends to be from their uh, sinus system. Um, you need to operate in, in guidelines are greater than one centimeter thick if you have a shift with any decreased uh, glass of coma scale. And if you operate and evacuate this, they have a good prognosis because they don't, this, uh, unlike this patient on the CTC, they usually don't, don't necessarily have brain injury underneath. They die from the increased pressure. On the other hand, acute subdural hematoma, they do have brain injury underneath, so it has slightly worse prognosis. Uh, um, but still, obviously, people can do well to get decompressed. Same sort of guidelines, a centimeter, a shift of a centimeter, a shift with a low GCS. Uh, survival is better and recovery better in younger patients. Subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, from brain trauma is usually peripheral, as you can see there. 
Uh, it's mostly in the sulci. Uh, these patients don't necessarily need an operation, but they should be monitored if their glossocomal scale is less than nine. Um, and you can do that with intraventricular ventriculosity, which is preferred because you can train the CSF. If you can't do that, they should at least need a uh, parenchymal uh, monitor. Uh, craniectomy can be considered for, uh, for uh, refractory uh, high ICPs. This is what a central subarachnoid hemorrhage looks like, most likely uh, aneurysmal bleed, just so you know the difference. Um, for contusions and trauma, frontal and temporal contusions are common, especially if you hit the back of your head or the front of your head, and it could be a counter crew from the back of the head. They actually get worse in four to five days, so the patient needs to be observed. They will blossom. They need to be observed closely. They can herniate, especially temporal lobe ones, they can herniate from the side. Punctate hemorrhages, uh, diffuse axonal injury from high impact injuries, hemorrhages in the axon, uh, represent a CP. Uh, their ICP could be high, it could be low. Um, prognosis is generally poor. Intracranial pressure by the Mon Monroe Keeley doctrine, I've seen this on the test, and ICP increases with increased volume. Uh, if you have an elevated uh, ICP, check for operable lesion. Um, you need a uh, you need a monitor on someone again. Vessel scale is less than nine. Uh, ventriculostomy is preferred, as I said. Maneuvers are you drain from the ventriculostomy, you maintain cerebral perfusion pressure, which is your cerebral uh, your MAP minus your ICP is greater than sixty. You raise the head of the bed, increase sedation. Uh, propofol actually decreases brain metabolism. Um, sometimes you need paralysis, mantle or hypertonic saline for osmolar therapy to uh, decrease ICPs, and of course you can do a decreased craniectomy. Most of the time, neurosurgeon would consider that, especially on the younger person, um, but not completely would they consider that. A decompressed craniectomy, by the way, is leaving the skull off and putting it in either in the abdominal wall or in the bone bank. Uh, for spinal cord, column and cord injury, um, a patient's blood trauma patient should have a collar and be on a spinal board. The nexus criteria for clearing it without any imaging is an alert patient, no pain, no deficit, no distracting injury, like chest rib fractures or a big femur fracture, and no tenderness. Everyone else gets a CT. Plain films are no good. CT can rule out a serious C-spine injury. Uh, uh, however, persistent pain or tenderness warrants an MRI. For patients who are unconscious, I think the current uh, bent is that you can clear them with just a CT, but if there's any suspicion, any kind of funniness, uh, especially the older patients, you might end up getting an MRI. An incomplete cord injury uh, warrants early uh, uh, stabilization and decompression of the injury. Uh, consider blunt cervical uh, vascular injury. Go a little bit more into that. Any complete cord injury above C5 is going to end up with a tracheostomy. This patient should be intubated. Steroid is no longer indicated in many centers. Uh, penetrating injuries usually are fixed deficits. Avoid hypotension and keep their blood pressure up in spinal cord injuries. These are typical spinal cord fractures. You can see odontoid fractures, type 1, 2, and 3. 2 is the most unstable one. 3 can also be unstable. Uh, Jefferson fractures, people with classic of uh, jumping into a pool and hitting their head in the bottom of the pool with an actual load. They can blow out C1. That can be unstable also. Of course, the classic hangman fracture got the name, of course, from hangman, and uh, its posterior element, and that is also unstable. The most common fractures, um, oh, chance fractures are highly unstable, three column fractures. Uh, the difference between that and a birth fracture is it only involves the vertebral body, uh, not the posterior elements like a chance fracture does. You can see on with my uh, pointer on the on the right for me. And fall from height, uh, always think of a compression fracture if someone falls from height and lands on their feet, they probably have a calcaneus fracture too. The four fractures, you can see type one there through the maxilla, type uh, two is pyramidal and goes up to the nasal uh, bone, an upper maxilla in orbit. And then type three is a, a craniofacial uh, diso uh, disassociation to the zygomas also. Uh, have to consider looking for uh, blunt uh, cerebral vessel injuries. For orbital fractures, you need to check for entrapping. You need to uh, check for a retroorbital hematoma. Could lose your vision with that. Check for hyphema. Always do a visual exam. Uh, for mandible fractures, have a three high, times higher incidence of uh, blunt 
uh, cerebral uh, vessel injury. Uh, basal skull fractures, uh, you get ear, nasal and ear canal CSF, hemotympanum, battle sign, which is uh, bruising around the ear. Raccoon's eyes would be an anterior basal skull fracture. Um, there's no need for antibiotics. You'll select out organisms and always check for facial nerve function if you have a, a basal skull fracture in the back. Criteria here is quite extensive. I think the thing to remember when looking up blunt cervical vascular injury is I you should consider with any kind of C-spine injury, any any kind of uh, Lefort fractures, uh, two and three, skull base fractures. Uh, most places will do it with patients who are unconscious with a severe brain injury. So there are centers that will do PAN scans that include a CTA of the neck as part of their PAN scan. You can have the, you can have a protocol to do that. Your chest images might not be as great, but they'll, they'll be fine. Um, for treatment, and you can see the, how you distinguish them there. Uh, basically, uh, uh, well, uh, grade four, uh, probably doesn't need to be treated because it's a total occlusion. But the treatment is for anticoagulation for patients you're not worried about bleeding, like a hemorrhage in their head. If they, if they have a concomitant head injury, they probably get aspirin. Anticoagulation is a little bit better than aspirin for treatment. Um, for neck trauma, uh, for blunt, you mainly worry about laryngeal fracture and secure an airway. The patients maintaining their airway, um, sitting up, make sure you take them to the operating room before you start putting them to sleep and, and trying to get it to secure their airway. For penetrating trauma, uh, it, it invades the platysma. It's considered a deep injury. Uh, secure airway as early as, as needed. Uh, management depends on the zone of the injury and the symptoms. So zone one is at the bottom. It goes from bottom to top, and that includes the great vessels. And so you don't, uh, if a patient is unstable, of course, in any of the zones, they go to the emergency, they go to the operating room to stop the bleeding. If they're stable, then in zone one, you need to work up the, the great vessels with a CTA, you need to get do an esophagram, and you need to uh, evaluate the trachea. Technically, if the test says you should do a bronchoscopy. Okay, in zone two, uh, some people still say that you can operate on zone two. I do, because I'm older. Uh, but, uh, you also, you can, uh, only need to operate if you have, uh, some hard signs. I think I'm gonna have that on the next slide. Let me see. Okay, yeah. So zone two, uh, you can do off of exploration if they're asymptomatic. They don't have, you know, hard signs like an expanding hematoma, airway compromise, the phages, emphysema. Then, uh, you can, uh, observe them. Actually, that's another branch. But you also can work it up again with a CTA. I would at least get a CTA. And, uh, and an esophagram and, uh, and, uh, you can decide on if you need a bronchoscopy or not depending on, on the, their symptoms. Zone three, uh, is up the, the only thing you're really worried about in the zone three are the, are the cerebral vessels, namely the carotid artery. Um, if they're, uh, if they're technically if they're asymptomatic, you can observe them. Might be worth a CTA though, if they have an injury that's proximal to the carotid artery, so that's what I would do. Okay, so chest trauma, general principle, second leading cause of traumatic breath after brain trauma. Um, if you have decreased or no breath sounds of shock, you need to decompress the chest. I know I've repeated that many times, but you always have to remember attention to your motor is always on the exam. Exception is the right main stand intubation. Of course, you can pull that back. That's more of a, uh, I, I don't think you'll see that on the exam, but that's more of a, you know, how you take care of patients. Difference between tamponade and tension on the question, the pneumothorax is always breath sound. It's either having breath sounds or not having breath sounds. A gunshot wound will likely need uh, a, a, a chest tube. Uh, the box is considered nipple to nipple, sternal notch, costal margin. But uh, there was a nice paper in the trauma looking at uh, death from heart injuries and really any kind of angle can get your heart. So you gotta think out of the box. Always do it fast. Again, ED thoracotomy is for, uh, 15 minutes plus minus uh, for signs of life. Um, no sound of the heart <clears throat> early for penetrating trauma. Use a chest tube that's 32. Uh, anytime we've used the smaller chest tubes, like some studies suggest, it's crazy. It just doesn't work at evacuating blood. Um, root fracture is the most common injury. Mortality increases with age. So old people who fracture their ribs, especially at least three rib fractures, they need to be admitted to the hospital. 
and uh, and and be taken care of and, and make sure their pain is controlled, make sure they know how to breathe, get physical therapy, so on and so forth. So this is a, a tension pneumothorax that uh, this x-ray should not exist. Uh, maybe it's post-mortem. I don't know. I got it off the Internet. But uh, that this is a clinical diagnosis. That patient would be dead with this x-ray. You need to decompress it as soon as you can. That decompress can be done with a needle, as I said before, or a finger thoracotomy, or, or a, a, a pigtail chest tube. That's what they use in the field. This is a sign of a flail chest. You know, flail chest is at least three ribs, maybe two, some say, with fractures on the, on the ribs in two spots. So you have a flail segment. You can see underneath they have a pulmonary contusion. <laughs> so uh, they always have a pulmonary contusion because the amount of trauma that hits the chest. And that's really what causes the problem with oxygenation. They can have a floating chest wall, uh, but that's not what's going to make you be uh, decrease your ventilation as the pain. Um, they do get they have respiratory distress, they have crepitus on their chest, and you may be able to see the paradoxical wall motion. Um, diagnosis by the clinical signs I mentioned, multiple rib fractures on chest x-ray or possibly chest VT, which you would most likely get. Um, and uh, you have to make sure they get adequate oxygen ventilation. Most Lots of times, if it's severe, they're going to get intubated. Um, they need to be resuscitated. Uh, it's still lung trauma, so they need to be good perfusion to the lung. So don't under-resuscitate just thinking, oh, this is like ARDS, I don't want to get too wet. But once the patient is resuscitated, there's no reason to keep on going crazy. Um, then they need the pain control. Uh, pulmonary contusion is an injury to the lung involving edema, bleeding to the airways, ventilation, perfusion, mismatch. It can manifest acutely, it involves more than 20% of the lung parenchyma resulting in hypoxia. It's usually associated with chest wall injury. Um, if they have bilateral pulmonary contusions, these, this could be fatal because uh, the, you just can't oxygenate a patient. These are the kind of patients, if you can get them to ECMO early, it would be uh, life-saving because these actually get better in about four to five days. Um, blast injuries, by the way, can cause bilateral, people die of bilateral, bilateral pulmonary contusions or brain contusions. That's part of the blast injuries. Blast injuries can kill you in three ways. With the blast itself, with the shrapnel, or flying objects that hit you, or if you get thrown a distance and have the blunt trauma of falling. Again, uh, for rib fixation, uh, very much indicated for uh, severe rib fractures um, on patients that are on the ventilator. It does decrease ventilation time. There are longer-term studies going out there to, to look at chronic pain and things like that. Uh, but at least we know it does decrease your time on the ventilator if you fix the rib. For penetrating thoracic trauma, you can see an algorithm there. If they're unstable, uh, they need a tube thoracostomy. And uh, if you have high output, you need uh, a, a thoracotomy. Always take a look at, at the heart with the best. If you're going to do a thoracotomy emergently, uh, like a decompressive thoracotomy, if they're near cardiac arrest, you're going to find out if they have fluid around the heart when you open them up. Um, but you do your fast if you're not sure exactly which way to go and, and you have some time to get to the operating room. Um, with regard to being stable, uh, you get your chest x-ray, chest tubes as needed, uh, get your uh, ultrasound of your heart, um, and it, again, think out of the box. Um, and if you get your... Once you get your chest CT, if uh, it's a gunshot wound, we'll talk about transmedial spinal injury. So it's fast uh, with a pericardial effusion. It's a subxiphoid window. You can see the right ventricle atrium and so on. So that if the patient is hypotensive, it could be that that's causing it. Chest wall incisions, the uh, resuscitative thoracotomy is down here. Uh, lots of times, especially if an injury on the right or if you want more room, uh, you'll end up with a clamshell thoracotomy. This trapdoor is used mainly for subclubbing, subclavian injuries. If you can't get exposure when you do a subclavicular view, you go down the sternum and then come across here, so you can do a trapdoor. Media sternotomy is for the great vessels, if you know the injuries there, um, or if you somehow you know the injuries to the heart and the patient's relatively stable, so you can plan. And then a posterior lateral thoracotomy, of course, is to, on the right, is good for esophageal injuries. Um, I mean, it's good for tracheal injuries. Uh, all the trachea is exposed on the right. On the left, uh, for lower esophageal injuries, and of course, any of the vessels on the left side. Uh, for injuries to the tracheal bronchial tree, these patients could have a massive air leak. They usually actually present with a tension pneumothorax, and then they get a massive air leak. Uh, 
Um, and uh, you can confirm it with bronchoscopy. If their leak is so bad and you can't oxygenate them because everything's going out the chest tube, if it's on the left side, push the tube into the right lung. If it's on the right side, get your bronchoscope and intubate the left lung. You can also look for the injury with your bronchoscope. This will temporize the patient so you can get them to the operating room. For lung lacerations, if you uh, encounter them in a DD door economy, you cross clamp the hilum with a baby clamp or any kind of vascular clamp that will cover it. Um, you have to take down the inferior pulmonary ligament to do that. You also need to take down the inferior pulmonary ligament to get a good shot at the aorta as a cross clamp that. Uh, injuries, you can suture, staple, do a tracheotomy to find a source of bleeding and, and suture that. Uh, you can do an anatomic resection if it goes down to the pulmonary vessels. Bronchial injuries should be repaired. Um, they need to be covered with torn muscle to leak. Um, a traumatic pneumonectomy is high mortality rate, but if the missile does it, then that's the way it goes. Um, of course, you need chest tubes afterwards. There's an atrial injury there. You can see it was lips, stitched closed, which you can do with atrial injuries. For cardiac injuries, you need to relieve the cardiac tampon on that may have what made the patient go into rest as a hemorrhagic shock. Uh, they have a better chance of survival. The cardiac tampon on did it because they uh, basically they're, they're, uh, they didn't have a shock state for a long period of time and then just stopped. Um, right ventricle uh, is the most common area injured, especially with stab wounds. For stab wounds, it has a higher survivability, less damage to the heart. You, lots of times you can get, gain control with the finger. Um, for atrial injuries, you can partially occlude and suture, just as you saw. Uh, you can't do that with a ventricle. Your sutures will tear out. You need to repair with pledges. It's good to try and see if you can just control with your finger and get the patient up to the operating room. Perhaps you can put the patient on bypass if you have control. You can use the Foley balloon. You can put it in there and, and just have to make sure you don't put too much traction on it so you make the hole bigger. You can also use skin staplers. It works. Um, you want to try and avoid the coronary arteries, but of course you have to stop the bleeding, so as best you can. You want to move the patient to the hemorrhage uh, OR, uh, where they might be able to go on bypass and get a better examination repair of the heart. You always have to look for other injuries in the heart if they had a penetrating trauma to internal injuries, or if you have a posterior injury, good luck. But uh, um, if you, but you need to look for internal injuries if uh, everything's stable and the, and the patient looks repaired. Uh, there's an injury to the ventricle. You can see the pledget. Okay, bronchial tear uh, with a uh, pulmonary vein injury can give you a massive air embolism. That's how Princess Diana died. Uh, it can be relatively stable when you get intubated and all of a sudden you go into cardiac arrest. In order to fix this, you need to do emergency thoracotomy, cross clamp the hilum, internal cardiac massage, manual ventilation of the left atrium and ventricle, and definitive repair in the OR. Good luck. I don't think I don't think anyone can really be saved with that. But the main thing is to to get a patient where they need to be um, and recognize it early, so you can get them to the operating room perhaps, and 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 at least take the fistula. Uh, you know, cross clamp in the hilum will will be save them. Um, for transmedial silent gunshot wounds, they need to be worked up. You think of it like a neck injury in your chest. So you need to look at the esophagus, you need to look at the trachea, the tie, and you need to look, do a CTA. Now, uh, if the missile is anterior mediastinum, you don't necessarily need to do, rule out the esophagus with the esophagram. But anything that's near the esophagus, you need to get an esophagram. Uh, or a scope. Stop again is probably a little bit better. If you do both of them, you have a higher percentage of catching an injury. And if you, again, if you have tracheal injury, you do a right door economy to fix it. Stop the injury is distal, you do a left door economy. Um, and if they're upper, the right door economy. And, uh, and, uh, you mobilize, debride, and patch these injuries. You can debride the, you can mobilize the lung about up to three or four centimeters. Uh, if you have a tracheal injury, so you can do a little, little resection. There's a tracheal injury, that one's in the neck. Um, esophageal perforations, uh, mostly always penetrating. Um, and uh, most of them will come from esophageal manipulation in the hospital. Uh, it needs to be diagnosed early so you can fix it. And uh, your repair, again, it's nice to cover them if you, uh, with intercostal muscle, pleura, things nearby. And they always leave a lot of drains in. Okay, uh, traumatic aortic disruption. Um, 
you can as a deceleration mechanism, usually from a car crash or a fall from a height. 85 of the people do not survive. It's 50-50. They can be on the left. They can be on the right. I know we get told we see them on the left, but those are the survivors. But the non-survivors, a lot of them are in the arch itself. Um, if you get a chest X-ray, you're going to have a wide immune system and, and loss of aortic valve. Everyone's going to get a chest X-ray. Uh, and of course, then we say do an angiogram. But if any kind of mechanism like this, invariably the patient's going to get a CTA anyway of the chest, and you'll see it. You have to make sure you get the uh, sagittal and a uh, cuts because uh, Sometimes the axle cuts will miss it if it's really small or a short distance. Uh, we used to say it's always a transection, but I think you can get some dissections too. If you catch it, and obviously the patient's stable, you want to keep their blood pressure a little bit low, you want to keep their heart rate low uh, until you decide what kind of operative intervention. It used to be young people got an open repair, older people get the and patient high risk at a end of long repair. But everyone gets endoluminal now because the incidence of spinal cord ischemia is much less if you do an endoluminal stunt, so that's the way it's going to be done. Um, some patients, if they have severe life, other life-threatening injuries, like a brain injury or things like that, you can offer non-operative intervention, and uh, they can be controlled, and some people can live for a long time like that. Perhaps later, uh, they can undergo a, a stent. This, of course, is a diaphragmatic hernia. That would be from a blowout most likely blunt trauma because the stomach's pushed up in the track. Of course, if you have any kind of penetrating injury near the diaphragm, you need to rule out a diaphragm injury. Uh, if the patient's stable, they get a CT, they have no other injuries. I kind of like to do my uh, laparoscopy a day later to see if anything else manifests itself. Go in there and then fix the diaphragm um, you can do it laparoscopically. Um, if uh, the patient needs it, if, if you need to, you can also do a laparotomy. Um, most likely you want to do, uh, you want to do laparoscopically because you get a chance to see the abdominal organ too. Um, it, a blunt diaphragm rupture is usually big, but it may not manifest itself in the first 24 to 48 hours. So people do have delayed diaphragmatic ruptures. If it's, if you catch it, uh, at the time of their injury, you do laparotomy because 50% of the patients could have something in the abdomen that needs to be fixed. Um, if you find it late, usually you have to fix it with a thoracotomy because it's going to be stuck. The organs are going to be stuck up there and you need to push them down, uh, dissect them off. Um, significant, always remember in blunt trauma that significant hemorrhage from the chest may be due to abdominal organ injury. I've seen this twice where the spleen was hemorrhaging with a diaphragm injury where they were bleeding out of their chest tube. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, if you have a stomach injury and a diaphragm injury at the same time, make sure you take time to clean out that chest. If you don't, you'll get guaranteed empyema. Okay. Um, for blunt abdominal trauma, consider a mechanism. If they're, uh, if they're not stable, uh, you need to make diagnosis with an ultrasound. Again, you might, might use DPL if, uh, if an ultrasound is equivocal. You take them for a laparotomy. If, uh, they have, if it's negative, then you have to look for the other regions which we already discussed in blunt trauma for bleeding. Um, and then, uh, and then again, if it's, uh, you can do a DPL if, you're, if you, you just can't find it. And then, uh, and then if they, they have some injuries that can be taken care of with angiography, you can do it that way also. Uh, sometimes in, if a patient is tender, but their CT is negative, then, uh, then you might you'll want to admit them for observation because they can still have a bowel injury uh, or perhaps a pancreatic injury that might not be picked up on CT. Um, if they're stable, again, uh, that, that's kind of answers that stable side. You do an abdominal CT. Uh, you see what kind of injuries they have. If it's something that can be non-operative management, you do that. If they need a laparotomy, you do that. Um, if the uh, patient is alert, uh, you can do an ultrasound, um, or you can just observe them, uh, depending on the mechanism of injury. You don't necessarily have to do a CT. And, um, again, if a patient has tenderness, you might want to, uh, you'll have to admit them anyway just to observe them because CT may not pick up a bowel injury. This is just showing one view of the fast on the right side with the, uh, in Morrison's pouch with the kidney and the liver, some blood there also. You also look back at the diaphragm. I didn't put everything in here. Same on the spleen side. On the spleen side, you definitely have to see the diaphragm because more blood will collect there first before it gets between the kidney and the spleen. Um, so, five, 
of all the CTs done, and one study, all CTs done for blunt trauma, only 5% of them are, are positive and something you need in, in stable patients. So if they have a, a, a low mechanism of injury, like many patients with balls that hit their head, they don't necessarily need a CT. They fall off their bike, and they're, and, and they're awake and alert, and then you can do a, a good exam. Uh, they don't necessarily need a CT. People who think you should CT everyone will point that they can have some missed injuries. Not, not all of them need to be operated on that. For people who should probably scan, seat belt signs, peritoneal signs, tenderness, uh, femur fractures uh, because it's distracting, lower rib fractures, definitely, you'll definitely miss the uh, spleen or liver injuries if you don't. Of course, if you have a positive fast. Um, chest x ray uh, can be good for nose. No other imaging, sorry. Uh, if you have free air or diaphragm injury, but I tell you, if you have a stable patient, they most likely will get a CT. But on the exam, you can, if you see a diaphragm injury, that you can do a laparotomy. So you got to fix that diaphragm. If you see free air, uh, they'll probably need a laparotomy also. Um, so a DPL, just in case it's, you, you might still get a question on it. Those are the numbers. 10 cc sees the blood or, or the numbers you see there. Um, if it's a, uh, a penetrating trauma patient, it's usually 5,000 to 10,000 uh, 10, RBCs. For uh, penetrating trauma, injury abdomen, um, gunshot wound, uh, it's fine. Uh, to, if the answer is take the patient in the operating room, I would say that. Okay, you're going to find an injury over 90% of the time. Exceptions might be just uh, from a, a oral type question uh, would be that if you have a, a seat, if they're perfectly stable and you have a tangential, looks like a tangential wound, you can see them. And also some centers will watch patients that get shot in the liver uh, if they're stable and so a high right upper quadrant wound. So of course you have to get a CT to, to kind of damage you have. Um, plain films, would be, the only time you get plain films in the abdomen is to check for gunshot missiles. Um, in my opinion, I think that's uh, probably there. So if you have a stab wound, if you have hard signs that you see there, then you operate on the patient. If the humidus is unstable, peritonitis, evisceration, blood from the GI tract, impalement. Um, otherwise, you, uh, most people would do a local wound exploration. If it goes penetrates the anterior fascia, that's enough to do some sort of a, either a laparoscopy or a laparotomy. You can choose laparoscopy uh, uh, as your uh, thing of choice if you uh, if you if you want to make sure. Uh, if your patient you can also uh, uh, do serial physical exams if uh, you don't necessarily need to do a local wound exploration. I don't know if that's going to be on, if the test is caught up to that, but uh, uh, it's, it's possible. But uh, do a local wound exploration. Um, you can uh, do a CT and observe. Uh, again, CT might not catch a subtle uh, bowel injury. Um, and then, of course, there's the EPL numbers there. If you have a flank or back wound, the patient is hemodynamically stable. Of course, you want to check uh, uh, for hematuria, but you also want to do a CT with triple contrast. Um, at least make sure you get the rectal contrast. I think there was a question we saw that said rectal contrast didn't necessarily say oral contrast. Make sure the patient gets rectal contrast so you can see the colon, which is in the flank. For damage control, you want to stop the bleeding and contamination and resuscitate then in the ICU. Um, uh, that you would do an ED thoracotomy for abdominal trauma if they arrest right in front of you in the ED and, and uh, or if they're in the OR and, and you're with the imminent laparotomy plan. Of course, you can use a Reboa if your center does it. You want to place this one in zone one up in the thorax uh, to stop the bleeding from the abdomen. Um, and for solid organ injuries, you want to control the hemorrhage. Uh, remove, of course, if it's something like this way that you can remove. For vascular injury, you need to repair, chunt, or ligate. For bowel injuries, you staple and do not repair. Uh, the pelvis, uh, if the pelvis is bleeding, do some preperitoneal packing. Or if you're already open the abdomen up, you can do pelvis packing too if they're bleeding in the abdomen. Uh, and then you might want to send the patient over to IR for uh, pelvis uh, to stop the bleeding that you can't see. Um, and also IR is good if you have packed the liver. I would get, uh, send them over to IR also just to see if there's any kind of arterial bleeding they can get rid of before you go back to the operating room. Uh, you want to leave the abdomen open to avoid compartment syndrome, um, but you might want you want to make sure it's a little bit tight because you want to use some of that 
compartment uh, pressure to stop the bleeding. Um, uh, so for trauma laparotomy, you prefer the neck, neck to the knees, a generous incision, pack four quadrants, let anesthesia catch up if you stop the bleeding. I remove the packs from the quadrants that weren't bleeding first, uh, and then you control the source of the bleeding. Um, you want to run the ball from the esophagus to the rectum. You have to look at every little inch of that ball. If you see a uh, hematoma in the wall of the ball near the ball wall, you need to explore it because it could have an injury underneath that hematoma. You want to look for any retroperitoneal hematoma. You have to check the lesser sac at the end of the case. Make sure you see the pancreas in the back of the stomach. And then you can need to decide on what type of closure, depending on what you did and what kind of injuries, if they need damage control or not. So you can see the uh, uh, splenic injuries there. You always like to think splenic and liver, grades one through three. One is one, two is in between one and three, three is three. And then uh, it gets worse after that. Um, down here, you can see a grade four injury, uh, grade five, shattered spleen, lots of hemoperitoneum. This is showing a pseudoaneurysm to the spleen. Um, so if the hemodynamic is unstable, you go to take the patient for a splenectomy. If it's the only injury and you've controlled it, you can do a splenography, use argo and bean, you can do a partial splenectomy, use pledge of the sutures to close it. I, always, I use mesh. And all my successful spinorphies, and if I decide to do it, they've always been successful. Of course, you can use some fiber and glue too. Um, you got it when you do splenectomy, or uh, what you can uh, in entail is you might have an injury to the tail of the pancreas, which will cause a subchronic abscess. And uh, you always have to be careful when you take down those short gastrics, you don't uh, uh, injure the greater curve of the stomach. So for non-operative management, they're hemically medically stable. Some people let them actually get a couple of units of blood to save their spleen. Of course, uh, nowadays you should send them to angiogram if you're doing that. Um, you uh, uh, about roughly. So the rule is it's, it's not perfect, but every uh, grade of spleen has roughly a 10% per grade. So it's actually kind of like six or seven percent for grade one, but it goes up to 35% for grade four. So you can you see what I mean. So all grade fours and fives now need to have go to IR and they usually get embolized. So if they're stable in a grade four or five, they should go to angiogram. Also, you consider going for embolization if the patient has a pseudoaneurysm on their CT scan. And also for consider for slow blood loss, like the units of blood here, large slow caps or hematoma. Uh, post angiogram, they might get some splenic pain. They could get an abscess, which you can take care of uh, later. Uh, of course, if you take the spleen out, you have to worry about overwhelming post splenectomy sepsis. Uh, it's legal 50% of the time it's from encapsulated bacteria. You know about strep pneumo, um, uh, meningitis, and uh, hemophilus. And uh, it's not as bad for people who get their spleens out for trauma. It's mostly for the more the uh, the, uh, um, the hemo, the hemo uh, uh, conditions. Uh, but it's real, and especially for kids if they get their spleen out early. You want to vaccinate them ideally for two weeks, but everyone gives the vaccines before the patient's discharged because they don't they want to make sure they get them. They might not come back. Um, and then it's a good idea to think about put, having a med brace, let's say they don't have a spleen, uh, a prescription for penicillin or ampicillin and ed education. Uh, so this is a sonography using fiber and glue. This is the kind of mesh that you use. Absorbable mesh works really well. So the anatomy of liver, you need to know, of course, you need to know that for your liver stuff anyway. And then you can see, obviously, uh, you're thinking clockwise. You're not starting at five on the top. You're starting at eight. So you're five, six, seven, and eight. One's in the middle. The four is in the big part of the left lobe, and two and three are out there. And so uh, <clears throat> it's important to know for trauma. Uh, of course, your, your anatomy of your uh, hepatic veins. And right down the middle of the liver is right down the middle of the hepatic vein. Depends on which side you go on. Okay. Um, so, hepatic trauma, only operate on them if they're unstable. You can make diagnosis by CT. 98 to 99% of the time, if they come in stable, they'll stay stable. Um, and then if you are in the operating room, uh, you want to pack first. And if packing uh, stops the bleeding, then you do some formal packing. So some pictures. Um, and uh, and then if the bleeding has stopped and you finish your damage control, you might not end up closing the patient uh, because you're going to come back, obviously. And then you want to go to IR in between. 
If packing doesn't work, you need to do a Pringle maneuver, which is uh, uh, basically cl a clamping with a vascular clamp or a vessel loop around the hepatodesial ligament, that includes the portal vein, portal hepatic artery, and the uh, biliary tree, uh, which is not your, necessarily your purpose, but it's there. Um, if it works, uh, then ligate. If it works, then ligate the obviously bleeders that you can see, open vessels, release to see the bleeders, repeat. You know, always give them a self a drink every like 15 minutes. If it continue uh, bleeding, you might have hepatic vein injury, uh, IVC. Again, you might, if it's behind the liver and you can push, put pressure on the liver and it stops, it's not, it's not worth taking a look in there. Uh, use the packing. Um, we talked about Schrock shunts, which is like a chest tube in the IVC. You have to place it through the right atrium uh, and uh, tie it down below the liver uh, and above. Um, you know, I, I don't know how many people actually use that. Uh, I know they have it down in Houston. Um, it seems to me like it would take a long time when someone is hemorrhaging. I think cross clamping the aorta, uh, and then clamping, uh, the IVC, uh, is probably the way to go. You're obviously going to need some more exposure. You'll have to go into the chest, into the lower part of your custom margin in order to see that. So we call that total isolation and then you can fix it. Um, in adjuncts uh, for liver, of course, you can use those big liver sutures. Stapling is good. Um, you can staple if you have hepatic vein. You can staple across the hepatic vein and get down there. It's nice and fast instead of trying to isolate around it. Um, uh, use an elemental patch at the end, argon beam, fibrin glue. Just be careful, fibrin glue. You don't have a big hole in the hepatic vein inside the liver there. It's going to go right to the heart. Okay, so this is compression. This is formal packing. They do it with a tuxedo. This actually is a nice track uh, uh, way if you have a bullet hole and it's bleeding and you don't want to cut the liver open to see what's bleeding uh, and it, it kind of stops with a, a Pringle maneuver. You can fill this with uh, fluid like a, um, a uh, Penrose drain uh, or something like that and, uh, and basically compress inside the hole. You can think of that if you, if you had that situation. Here's a omental packing. That's a Pringle maneuver with a vascular clamp. Don't use a Kelly. Uh, this is isolation of the liver uh, so with an IVC injury. Okay, so you might get liver necrosis uh, with all this stuff going on. Uh, this is usually after you operate on someone and you packed or, or you've had the light, maybe uh, uh, you've had an injury to the hepatic artery and you've had to ligate it. Um, uh, hemobilia is from an arterial biliary fistula. Future patients present with a GI bleed soon after their trauma, maybe delayed after their trauma. They usually have a history of trauma, or perhaps they have a tumor uh, that they don't know about. Anyway, the blood's coming from the uh, common bile duct. You see that on uh, endoscopy. And uh, you want to do uh, embolize that. Um, and then uh, for biliary ascites, uh, which is common after liver surgery, taking a few patients, you just kind of drain it with laparoscopy. They feel a whole lot better because this is biliary ascites is painful. And then uh, you leave drains. Most of the time, any kind of biliary fistula is going to flow spontaneously. You can see the grades of the renal injuries there. Uh, uh, basically, uh, um, up to uh, uh, grade, uh, let's see, grade three. Uh, it, it doesn't involve the pelvis of the kidney. Once you uh, get to grade four, it might involve segmental vessels and the pelvis of the kidney. We're thinking about repairing the pelvis so they don't have a urine leak. Um, and you can see that it gets worse as time goes on here. Uh, so non-operative management of uh, kidney injuries is the key. It can look absolutely horrendous. You can have two piece, pieces of the kidney separated with a huge hematoma in them. But if it's contained and, and they're and they're not unstable, um, you don't operate on them, especially in blunt trauma. Um, you can drain a urinoma if they get one later on. In penetrating trauma, we also will can look. You can see a bullet that goes into the area of the kidney. If there's no expanding hematoma, and you don't have any obvious liver, urine leak, you don't have to explore those either. Um, it's a judgment call, but you don't have to explore those. Uh, you, when you suture the kidney, you suture with pledgets also. If you have a hole in the collecting system, you need to use absorbable sutures. Uh, you can do a partial nephrectomy and suture with pledgets. 
Uh, if you have a CT and you, and you have no uh, devascularized kidney, you don't explore. Uh, um, you know, vascular surgeons tell you there's no use to anymore by the time you end up knowing that kidney's kind of dead. Uh, it may be a source of hypertension in the future. Um, if, the, if the nephrectomy is contemplated, always check the other kidney, either with an on-table pilogram or some people say they just feel it and if it feels normal, but you can, you, you know, it might make it, it might make your work a little bit harder to save a kidney if you're not sure the other kidney is good. So for ural injuries, almost always penetrating or iatrogenic. Um, uh, hopefully you can find them early. Uh, so wherever the missile goes, make sure you follow the pathway of the ureter if it's going that way or a stab wound. Uh, repair over a stent if it's a nice simple repair. If you've lost length, it's distal injury. You you do a psoas a hitch because you kind of attach the bladder to the psoas muscle and replant the kidney uh, the ureter there. You can do a biore flap if it's in the middle. Um, if it's in the proximal, most likely you have to do an nephrectomy. Um, so bladder injuries, uh, uh, gross hematuria, they always have gross hematuria. Um, you want to use the retrograde cystogram uh, to find the injury. They're mostly exoperineal, about 80% or so, 70%. Um, and you basically just drain them for two weeks and the hole usually closes. Uh, sometimes if they're right next to a, a pubis injury, they won't close and they need to be repaired, usually at the time that the orthopedic surgeon wants to do their, do their uh, bone repair. Um, not ideal for them, they get infections that way. If it's intraperitoneal, you're supposed to repair it, uh, use an absorbable two layers, absorbable suture. Okay, urethra injuries, if you have blood demiatus, bruising in the genitalia, high riding prostate on rectal exam, um, uh, you can suspect with pubis fractures, do a retrograde urethrogram in the trauma bay before you place a foley in. If you have something like you see here, then you probably shouldn't place a foley in. You should Leave it up to your urologist if that's what he wants to do. Um, uh, but if the patient is not draining any urine, then you have to put a superfibrin catheter in. These injuries are, are do a lot better if they're fixed on a delayed fashion. So for duodenal injuries, you can see there that uh, every portion of the duodenal, it gets worse um, as, as as the grade goes up. Of course, the second portion of duodenum uh, is a little bit more selective and, and uh, higher grades even for not much perception. Different ways to handle uh, duodenal injuries, mainly second portion. Um, you uh, uh, can uh, do a pyloric exclusion, which not many people do anymore. They really just kind of go for it uh, and fix the duodenum, thinking that uh, they don't need to do a bypass. You can protect this by putting a piece of bowel on it and using the serosal as a serosal patch um, after you repair it, of course. This is triple tube, where you put a tube that drains the duodenum, you put a tube that you put a gastrostomy tube and a feeding invasionostomy tube. And this is uh, if you have a, a loss of a lot of wall, you can do a room Y up to it. Uh, of course, in a trauma situation, uh, this is all stuff that might not heal that well. If you're doing damage control, you're going to have to come back and, and figure it out a little bit later to try and, try and control the, the uh, contamination. For pancreatic uh, injuries, uh, you can see the, the uh, Classification there, usually they, you don't get to a duct injury until it's three, you do distal pancreatectomy over here, it's grade three. Anything near the head, uh, you really just drain. Uh, if you have massive disruption of the pancreatic head or grade five with the, with the duodenal also on top of it, and uh, it's done, a whipple is done by the injury itself, then you might do a whipple. I'll tell you how. Um, so grade two, you do nothing. Grade two, you, I mean, grade one, grade two, you better put a drain in just because, you know, you can't sure leak. It, and don't, don't go out of your way to prove there's a leak with getting ERCP or something like that in the operating room. Just put a drain in because if there's a leak, the drain's going to work anyway. Uh, if you could, obvious grade three injury, you do distal pancreatectomy. Grade four, drain, drain, drain. And then for five, you basically, uh, debris, uh, what's dead. You stop the bleeding because there's usually uh, uh, patients that are in uh, damage control mode because there's lots of big vessels there. Um, you staple the duodenum. And really, you come back in 48 hours, close the common bile duct. Uh, you come back in 48 hours. Now the bile duct's bigger, so it'll uh, be bigger for anastomosis. Uh, you can you know, assess the viability and remove more tissue. Um, you can uh, use the pancreas uh, 
Uh, for sutures, it's better uh, to complete the Whipple after the damage control. Virginia, you want to say something or? Okay. No, I just came on to, uh, you know, whenever you finish wrapping up, I have a bunch of things for the residents. So keep going. Okay. I'm going to, uh, I'm getting there. I figured I was at land and I, I think this, I hope this stuff is good for you. Um, no, it's excellent. Yeah, no, please keep going. Um, I just want to respect everyone's time because it is supposed to end at 3.30, but, um, you know. Just... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm almost there. I think, okay. uh, I think I'm, I got less than 20 slides. So okay. stomach injury is pretty simple. Fix the hole, but make sure you always look in the back. So if you get an injury to the anterior stomach, you always got to look at the posterior stomach. Um, and you can see that if you have a real big injury, you might have to do a resection and, and do a mastomosis. Uh, blunts uh, will be a blowout. This happens to kids actually a lot, little kids, toddlers, so be careful. Uh, don't miss it on them. I've seen two of them. And you always need to look for that diaphragm injury. Small bowel is pretty easy, very more common in penetrating trauma. Uh, you can either close the hole if it's small or uh, resect and, and repair them transversely. So you don't want to try and get the maximum lift out that you can. Uh, very unusual to get a blunt uh, uh, bowel injury, but you can with seatbelt, panel bars, compression against the spine. If you have a chance fracture, you have to think about it, especially around L1 or T12. Uh, high index of suspicion uh, with thick and bowel. You can see it on CT now. CTs are getting better. But might you just keep in mind it might not see it, and so you might you need to keep the people around if they're tender. Thick and bowel, straining of the mesentery for your error, of course, that's a hard sign. If you're a pre flu without a solid organ injury, you have to be highly suspicious. Um, and then uh, obviously repair the same way. If you have damage control, you, you leave them staples and come back and fix them the next day or the day after. For colon injuries, uh, close the holes are small, resected, large, and, and divitalized. Primary repair is the way to go with left colon injuries now. It used to not be the way. But if you have a, lose a lot of the colon or significant other injuries, it's very shocking you can do a colostomy. You can always, in damage control, uh, leave everything stapled and come back and fix it uh, when you come back. Uh, if, it's, if it's to the right of the middle colic, you should probably do a right hemicolectomy. Um, and flank wounds, again, assess them uh, uh, with rectal contrast. So for rectal injuries, uh, if it's below the perineal reflection, divert them. Wash the rectum out. Plus minus free sacral danes. If it's on the test, I would say yes. Um, and then for perforations above the perineal reflection, you uh, resect the area and give them a cloth. You know, don't repair it. Don't do uh, an asthenosis on that rectal injury. For trans pelvic gunshot wounds, you need to check for rectal blood. Consider parcoscopy. You need to check for gross hematuria. And then uh, you obviously need to set the pulses in the leg. Likely to get a CTA anyway. Uh, if the patient's stable, if they're unstable, then you're, you're going to find all that stuff in the OR. Uh, for retroperitoneal hematoma, zone one, involve the aorta and its major branches uh, and the IVC. Zone two is the kidneys. We already talked a little bit about that, even for penetrating trauma. If there's no expanding hematoma, you might be able to watch them or not explore them. Uh, you always explore zone one injuries. Of course, if you've got a CAT scan and it's from blunt trauma, you can consider grafting if you see something. Uh, endograft. And then uh, for pelvis injuries, you never explore them in blunt trauma unless there's active hemorrhage. Uh, you can pack them. Of course, you can go to IR. We'll talk about health level factors at the end. Uh, and then uh, for penetrating, you need to explore because you need to rule out iliac vessel injuries. Make sure uh, that you keep the principles of proximal and distal control before you open up the hematoma you, if it's contained. For vascular injuries, dynamic control, super renal aorta, subdiaphragmatic control, the baby vascular clamp or aortic stamp. Yes, for an aortic stamp, you can press it right on the aorta at the diaphragm. You might need to do a Maddox maneuver to see the left side of the aorta and the viscera and the uh, vessel, uh, vessels on that side and the SMA and the celiac axis. For the IC, IVC and the right renal vascular, can tell maneuver, which is manipulating everything from the right to the left with the right column. Basically, you're taking down the left column and the right column from what side you are, and the spleen and pushing it all over uh, so you can see the aorta. For people who have approached the aorta in the old vascular days, that way to repair an aneurysm, you might have seen that, but I guess you'll never see that again. Um, so, infrarenal aorta um, and the IVC and the vessels, you, re respect the, you reflect the mesentery securely, and you have great access to the aorta. Uh, you may have to transect the right common iliac artery, that's always said, to get access to the right common iliac vein, which is behind it. 
Uh, stable, uh, stable patients with injuries discovered on CT considered for endovascular repair. Uh, busy slide, but it has it all here, I think. For your repair, use PTFE graft if you need to. Uh, if you, it might be a question where we'll say you had to repair an infrarenal aorta and there was a colon injury. Look for the answer that says do an axial by fem fem fem. I always love to say that you probably should not compare, uh, put PTF graft in with a colon injury if it's there. Um, if you have a subhepatic and suprarenal uh, uh, for uh, for IBC, you repair it. But if your patient's hemorrhaging, you can ligate if it's infrarenal. Uh, you can ligate if it's a, a suprarenal too, but you really should try and repair it. Uh, if you have to do what you have to do and, and maybe figure it out later, but you try and repair those. Um, remember, a stent, a, 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 a shunt in the operating room can be good for any damage control. Uh, for any vessel, and they can come back and figure out how to repair it later. Anything in the celiac axis, you ligate. It's not going to hurt anything. Uh, renal vessels, you can ligate, obviously, to take the kidney out, uh, repair if it's an isolated kidney, iliac artery repair. Um, you can ligate it if you ha if it's a contaminated field and do a fen fen bypass. Again, look for that. Iliac vein, you should re can repair. Or if you have to, you can ligate. Uh, SMA, obviously, you want to try and repair that. It, it, it does say that you can, if it's near the takeoff of the aorta, you can uh, ligate it uh, um, if a patient's desanguinating and they might do okay. Uh, or, you can, or you can plan a bypass. Uh, SMV, you want to try and repair, might, may ligate if you have to. Possible bypass for that also. If the injury is behind the pancreas, they talk about transecting the pancreas to get to it. Okay, use two big clamps. And, uh, clamp the pancreas and transect it. Obviously, you might have to do a distal pancreatectomy after that. Um, the hepatic artery, uh, very small. You really can't repair it. I guess you can try. Obviously, if it's just one side or the other, you can uh, ligate it. But even consider ligating it uh, if, because you have the portal vein. If you have both, then, you're, uh, then you have to repair something. Uh, but 50% of people with a portal vein in a series that had it, uh, portal vein ligation can survive also if you need to do it. Uh, but you do try to repair it. Use staff in the same when possible, not, not PTFE, PTFE uh, is, uh, would be the answer. Okay, so for pelvis fractures, if you uh, if they're unstable, uh, you need to stabilize their pelvis. Uh, you might consider preperitoneal packing, angioambulization, depending on what your center does. Of course, you can use one thing the slide doesn't have is Reboa. If you can do Reboa, you, uh, uh, you put it on uh, zone three just above the pelvis and the abdominal lower abdominal aorta. Um, if you have a fast, you have to do a fast. If the fast is positive, you have to go to the OR uh, for examination of your abdomen. While you're there, you might as well do some packing and then send the patient for an angiogram afterward. If you have the patient uh, stable and you have a blush on CT, then uh, you might send them for angio for that. Just so you know, compression fractures, it gets worse as you go on. This is called type three. It's called these are people who get hit when they're running across the street. This is a uh, type three. It's really bad because you can fracture one side and you open up the other. Uh, they can bleed a lot. This is the one that's known to bleed the most. The type th type three APC open book fracture with posterior disruption and anterior disruption. The vertical shear usually fall from a height, um, and this also bleeds a lot. So all these people need to have uh, a um, a binder put on them or a sheet that you can wrap around them. Orthopedics will probably say, oh, you don't need to uh, uh, bind the compression fractures because they're already compressed. But you guys just put a binder on and let them worry about it later. Um, you can use Reboa, we said. Uh, make sure you do your fast so you can decide if the patient needs an operation or not. Uh, if not, then and you have a, a responsive interventional radiology department, uh, send them there. It's like an ICU down there. You should, the doctor should go with them so you can watch them. Um, and or if you do retroperitoneal packing, which is um, in, behind the bladder, I um, mean, in, right in front of the bladder above the peritoneum, that's what you do. Um, basically, uh, if you have a hard times of a vascular injury in your vessels, um, you need to work it up. If obviously, if uh, you might just go right to the operating room if it's penetrating trauma, you should. If it's done complex fracture, you might want to get a CTA. Um, if you have soft signs, the CTA is recommended, especially complex fractures near the uh, artery, um, uh, like especially around the knee. The popliteal injury is, uh, is really bad. 
So it's just an algorithm of uh, you get you get the slide set, then you'll see all this of what to do for a patient that has uh, um, uh, vessels, uh, vessel injury in their artery. So for extremity fractures, um, if, uh, if the pulses, make sure you reduce them, and then you might check for a pulse again. The pulse might come back. Document neuro neurologic exam, reduction of fe fe femur fractures can reduce blood loss. <clears throat> you want to repair long bone and fracture 24 hours if possible. Decrease the rate of fat embolism. Hit those locations or orthopedic emergencies and they come in and, and put it back in. Uh, open fractures need to be washed out in eight hours, controversial, but that's what the, the standard would be, sort of the standard right now. Uh, so just say that. And then uh, check for compartment syndrome, stabilize orthopedic injuries prior to vascular repair. NSF with one hour for open fractures. This is the Costillo uh, classification of open fractures. If it's type 3, then you use centomycin also. Um, for compartment syndrome, you got the five Ps. Really, this is the only P you need to know because if you got these Ps, it's too late. Pain on passive motion is enough. Even pain is enough with a tight compartment. Um, in the leg, you, the compartment that usually goes first is the anterior compartment. Um, you want to check your compartment pressure. 30 is a good number. 20 to 30 is a good number. They'll talk about 20 to 30 difference on the diastolic blood pressure. This is all BS. If you think the patient needs uh, a fasciotomy, then they need a fasciotomy. You want to do all four compartments, which is the anterior, lateral, uh, deep uh, uh, posterior, and superficial posterior. You get this from the from the medial side. You get these from the lateral side. Two two incisions, two compartments in the arm, anterior and posterior. Uh, I figured out this is a good place to put this. Uh, Intra-abdominal hypertension is, is claimed over 12 on your bladder pressure. But the syndrome is a higher uh, intra-abdominal hypertension with oligoria, increased respiratory pressures, and hypotension. That's abdominal compartment syndrome. Of course, you can fix that with the laparotomy. So pregnant women uh, are hypovolemic, so uh, uh, they can tolerate shock, so be careful of them. Fetal distress can be an early sign of uh, shock in the mother. Save the baby. You have to save the mother. Make sure you check for a fetal uh, blood mixing with the mother, especially if they're uh, negative, um, Rh negative. Uh, placenta abruption is most common injury to the fetus, the fetus, so they get an ultrasound. Women with viable pregnancies greater than 25 weeks, third trimester, they need to be monitored in the hospital for contract six hours. That monitoring needs to start in the emergency department because it takes two or three hours to get them upstairs. Postmortem C-section is successful only if the fetus is viable, has uh, fetal heart tones, and can be done in five to ten minutes. Uh, just know these things. Degree of death of the burn, rule of nines, burn physiology, they're hyperdynamic. Uh, resuscitation, I just put the Parkland formula here, but they should give you which formula they want to use. It's an example of uh, how to figure it out. You give half of it in the first eight hours. Uh, if they have full thickness to the extremities, digits, or torso, you need to do an escherotomy. Here's a picture of that there. Um, you want to do early excision of third and deep second degree burns. Cover with split thickness skin grafts if you can. Use allograft for culture skin if it's a large uh, resection. Early nutrition, two grams of protein per kilogram. Uh, you want to intubate inhalation injuries. Be highly suspicious, especially if they're going for transfer to a burn center. And do Bronx early there. You still have myelin as a, a skin care at night and something different during the day because so, it's so painful. Um, always think, remember hydrofluoric acid and calcium gluconate. It's a favorite question. Uh, electrical burns, they can be deep and spare the skin, so you're checking for lots of tenderness along the extremities. They might need a fasciotomy if that's the case. Check for myoglobin. Make sure the urine output is a lot more. For burns, you want to get them up to half a cc per kilogram for adults once you do this. For these guys, you want them up to 100 cc cardiac monitoring. Frostbite and hypothermia, uh, rapid rewarming, warm blankets, bear hugger, uh, all this stuff. If they're lower than 32 degrees, uh, you might want to uh, do some cavity rewarming. Um, uh, you, you've got to continue CPR until they're about 35 degrees uh, to make sure they're warm and dead. Um, and then uh, just the Bertillium is a drug to use for arrhythmias uh, in cold patients. For uh, frostbite, rewarm, uh, yeah, they have superficial and deep, there's four degrees, but so basically they're white skin on, on superficial, really dark skin on deep. This is grade one here, 
uh, pink skin. Uh, you want to rehydrate, and and we do use intervascular thrombolytics. So, so we're placing a, a catheter in their artery and putting some TPA down there if it's within 24 hours. Um, and you always wait for weeks to help demarcate in the breathing, and that's it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, a few questions from the audience. First one is, is it true that needle thoracotomies are done at the anterior axillary line, either in the fifth or um, fourth intercostal space? Yeah, basically at the fifth intercostal space, which we say basically right below the nipple, um, for a woman in that intermammary fold. Okay. Um, what is, uh, can you expand a bit on the correct boards technique for a DPL? Oh, so uh, I guess there's two. It's, it, think of it like a, a laparoscopy. So if you do the open technique, a Hassana technique, you want to grasp the fascia and uh, uh, make a hole in the fascia and then uh, grasp the uh, peritoneum. And, and so that's an open technique. If you uh, if you have the DPL kit, that's a Seldinger technique. You have to make the skin incision because you don't want to try and force something through the skin. It makes it harder. And then you feel two pops. You lift the abdomen up, just like you do for, with a uh, ferrous needle, um, you, if you use that method to get into for laparoscopy. You feel two pops, and then uh, and then make sure the fluid goes in there easily. You always uh, withdraw first to see if you've got gross uh, blood. And if you've got gross blood, that's enough. Um, and, uh, and otherwise, you put a liter of uh, fluid in there. By gravity, you put the bag on the floor and let it come back by gravity. You wait for about 700 cc's of fluid and see if you can read a newspaper through the uh, fluid. Send it to the lab and see if it's got more than 100,000 uh, things. Lots okay. of times in this day and age, you, you do DPLs to see if there's boundaries for contamination. Lots of, sometimes you do it in the ICU, but th okay. that's how you do it. Great, thank you. Can you please um, touch on rib fixation and plating? Uh, what, what about rib fixation? Uh, just, I guess they just said touch upon um, when is um, plating necessary for rib fracture? So I think that if you have multiple fractured ribs, especially a, a flailed chest and the patient is intubated, um, uh, you can get them, uh, studies have shown you can get them off the ventilator uh, if you do rib fixation. Okay. I think if you have a patient that has multiple fractured ribs and a lot of pain and is not intubated, uh, I think that people who do rib fixation would also fix them then uh, to decrease their pain. One one thing uh, is that patients who have a uh, flail chest, only 50% of them um, go back to, are able to go back to work because of chronic pain. So uh, that study is still ongoing as to how it decreases chronic pain and, and pain and, and, uh, and lifestyle. Okay. Sorry, I'm in the hospital. Uh, are there any roles for ligating the internal mammary artery during a resuscitative thoracotomy? Uh, usually, if uh, usually they're not bleeding if you're doing a, a, a resuscitative thoracotomy, but if you're successful, they'll start to bleed, and yes. Okay. And then last, for diaphragm repairs, when to use mesh, and what's the size cutoff for that? I tell you, it, it, you can you you can see a huge hole in the diaphragm when you get in there, but you put a few Babcocks on it, and. Uh, and uh, you start pulling them together, it actually comes together pretty nicely. So uh, I didn't say how to repair it, but basically uh, I do a um, mattress uh, suture with permanent uh, suture. It could be proline. Uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, and big suture, so number one or zero. And you might need to use a mesh if you have a big injury towards the center of the diaphragm where it's more less muscle and more ligament and you can't get it together, you might have to use mesh then. But you'll be surprised, even at huge injuries, you'll, you'll pull it together. Sorry. All right, well, that's all the questions that they have. Um, thanks, Dr. Dwyer, so much for that huge comprehensive discussion on trauma. We'll see you tomorrow afternoon for critical care. All right, all right. Awesome.